Hi, we are Team Ultraman Rising. We have Ryo Yanbe, visual development artist. Also, we have Minako Tomi. We like to call her Tomi, uh, Tomi Gahara. She's also a visive artist on Ultraman. And my name's Sunmin. I was the art director on the film. And I just, you know, wanted to say thank you for coming. And, you know, uh, we're going to start uh, the presentation like uh, about right now and then about like 8 p.m. So about like 55 minutes later, uh, we're going to do a presentation for 55 minutes and then we're going to do audience Q&A for 25 minutes. So if you have any questions, just like put it in the Q&A box and we'll get to those questions. Uh, some other rules that I'm seeing is that please don't ask for contact information or portfolio reviews or anything like that, or like scripts or pitches and stuff like that, because we're not allowed to look at them. But anyway, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of just like housekeeping stuff. And we're going to go into the presentation. Yay. Hey. Okay. Everybody, thank you so much for coming. So I'm going to start this presentation. So really quickly, Ultraman Rising, we really wanted to show you a behind the scenes in partnership with Asians Animation, but also we wanted to show you all a kind of a different point of view of what we do, basically, because uh, all three of us have different points of views. We have different experiences and the way we think are very different. And so we wanted to show you a little bit of our daily habits on how we kind of go about our jobs and stuff like that mixed with some of the Ultraman work that we've done that you're going to, uh, you're about to see. So, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to talk briefly about the art direction before I handed a, a presentation over to Ryo and Tomi. So I actually started on this project when it was in its like infancy before even when it was Ultraman. I, I actually worked on it in 2017 as a VizDev artist for a project called uh, Made in Japan, where it was a, a movie that was paying homage to Ultraman. So actually, it wasn't really an Ultraman film, but Emmy was still there in it. And so what happened was, was that it got canceled. And then, you know, fast forward, Shannon brought this project that he wrote um, to Netflix. And Netflix was in conversations with Tsuburaya, the people who own Ultraman. And so they were like, you know what? This looks like a perfect marriage. Why don't we just make an Ultraman film? And so that's how it started. And really strangely, I bumped into Shannon in the cafeteria when that was all happening. And the project that I was on, this is like years later. I mean, the project I was on got canceled. And so I was just floating around and I bumped into him. He's like, hey, do you have time to make some pitch images? And I was like, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, if you're giving me a job... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so from there, I created this image. It's like, this is, this is kind of like one of the early versions of the final image that we used for promo and stuff like that. And, and for the film, but you can see here that, you know, uh, Ultraman had fought with, um, Gigantron. So he's like scratched and stuff, but it's kind of a fun early version, but yeah, I mean, these, this image and the next image I actually created very early on during those times where I wasn't on the project and Shannon had reached out to me to, to create um, some of these like kind of beat images for the pitch. And we actually successfully like it went through and we started to, and, and I was finally hired. And then uh, we finally kind of got into style creation. And so one of the early things that Marcos and I, and Marcos uh, was the production designer. He he's obviously he's Mr. Framed Inc. He does comics, he does layout, like he's, just an art, amazing artist and amazing person. But yeah, he, uh, he and I, like we were talking about style. And so very early on, we knew that we were going to have a relationship with ILM VFX, especially uh, the London side, which was led by Hayden um, Jones. And one of the things that the director said that they wanted was like, we want the manga style. And so I was like, okay, like, let's, let's think about this. How can we bridge a gap between our vendor studio or production partner studio, basically. That's like kind of how we call them, um, production partners. And and like this manga style, and when you look at manga backgrounds, a lot of the times they'll take photos 
and they'll posterize them and they'll clean it up and then make it look kind of like illustration-y. And so I was thinking, man, like that would be such a great way to kind of utilize ILM's vast live action library, but also, you know, do something stylistic at the same time. And so, you know, you can see here, uh, these are some early explorations of the style. And fun fact is that, you know, slowly I kind of realized like, oh, we don't need, really need to use wood textures for wood textures, or we don't need to use like, you know, fabric textures for fabric textures. We can actually mix these textures together and like use them how they feel. And so one of the fun facts is that, you know, Gigantron skin, like those little bumps, those are actually posterized um, bubble wraps that you get in your Amazon package. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, like these were certain things that we developed and, you know, from there we built color. I mean, color was very simplistic in the way that we went about it. I mean, we did have like a watercolory kind of esque thing going on, but also, you know, color like choices wise, like we tried to make it pretty specific as well. And so, you know, this went to kind of more on the environment end. Um, so this piece uh, with the, with in Tokyo, this one is like done very, very early on. This is probably, I mean, one of the first things that we created when, when it was finally kind of, uh, we were hired and moving forward. So after we did a little bit of this exploration, uh, we were ready to kind of like plan on you know, going into production and all that stuff. And it was very obvious to us. I mean, you know, Marcos is not Japanese. I'm not Japanese. And so it was obviously um, we needed the help of um, artists who actually are from the culture of Japan or cultural consultants, but also folks who can also kind of like open up that cultural accuracy and blend in between like the very accurate to the imaginative and the blend in between. And so um, amongst our amazing artists, there was Tomi and Ryo who did a lot of those cultural accurate um, portions, but also like the blend in between to imaginative. And so you'll see that beautiful process through uh, the rest of this presentation. And Tomi, do you want to go ahead? Thank you, Sami. Yes. Uh, so on this project, I was responsible for mainly set design, uh, set dressing, graphic design, and costume design. Especially for those uh, set, set or location that has a cultural, uh, that needs to bring cultural accuracy. For example, this location is press conference room when Ken Sato, the main character of our film, moved to Tokyo Giants from LA Dodgers, which is based on actual hotel name, uh, Teikoku Hotel, known as a place for Tokyo Giants press room. So when I launched on this assignment, uh, we also had an internal cultural committee consisted by our Japanese crew of the film, including me and Ryo from our team and story team, production team with the cultural authenticity advisor. So we had a weekly basis uh, communication and like go through all of, the, all of the art and design to see if it's culturally co co accurate and we delivered like a cultural authenticity in the film. So this one, uh, with that conversation and then reference from a cultural authenticity as advisor, I dive into more deeper research about architectural detail or like even the spacing, like how interviewer interviewing um, time that they use space. That yeah. So this was I personally come from TV background, and this process of making the production art of actually the Ultraman Rising was my very first feature film experience. For me, so I was like so excited all the time, and this was like first time doing the production art too. So I learned a lot about the importance of research and the communication with the uh, like a uh, committee because everyone has a, a lot of knowledge about the cultural authenticity. So I had a great help on that, on this occasion. And so this one, I try to make the gag of having Ken have a lot of mic while uh, Coach Shimura, which was, which used to be in the interview, sorry, together with Ken, that ha who has only one mic. 
I try to have fun on this assignment too. So, and next location is Tokyo Dome, uh, which is known as home of Tokyo Giants. A lot of artists work on this set. Um, I was responsible for doing the graphic design to do the final touch on this location because Tokyo Dome is such a huge uh, I icon in Tokyo. Only one Tokyo Dome exists in Japan. Like I had, I felt a lot of responsibility to make it feel like a Tokyo Dome. So I did a lot of visual research of uh, what kind of graphics make it feel like a Tokyo Dome. And I kept those iconic graphics while adding our original graphics to the to related to the film, for example, like a director's uh, side company's advertisement here, which you can see in the film too. Also, some of the bank advertisement with Camille, which is a uh, kaiju from Ultraman. So. Wait, you told me. Um, so which ones are the are directors' companies on here? This one, number fifteen and number eight. 17 and number 18 is mm -hmm. so our director. There's like a Kub Kubo's yes. like character in it, right? Mm -hmm. It's a hoo 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 production. Yeah. Like a let, uh, beneath yeah. the red one. Yeah. You can find I it and hit the home run. Yeah, you can find the Easter egg. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also John Aoshima's Yakitori restaurant. Yes. John Aoshima's John yeah. always needs to put, put a plug in there. He's right here, <laughs> number 17. Yeah. <laughs> He's trying to do after the direct. Yeah, you, you'll see. <laughs> oh, you'll see. Sorry, go ahead. Like, still hit. Yeah. And there's a very iconic hallway, too, in the Tokyo Dome, where uh, the wall is filled with legendary baseball player from Tokyo Giants. Uh, I had the privilege to paint over the Tony Fuchile's amazing drawing of the baseball player. This location um, is, I think a lot of people can recognize it as a Tokyo Dome. Um, like a little bit of a story, like I graduated high school where the baseball team was so strong and a lot of my high school friends became baseball player and one of them becomes baseball player of Tokyo Giants who watched this film and he contacted me like more than 20 years after we saw last time and like he, he was like hey you did the Tokyo Dome <laughs> can you can we, I, I saw the Tokyo Dome in the film like you want to come to see the real Tokyo Dome and I visited the Tokyo Dome like a few months ago isn't that insane? By the way, like that you Crazy. worked on a you worked on a film that has Tokyo the Tokyo Dome, and your classmate is like playing yeah. as a professional at the Tokyo Dome, and you get invited. It's just <laughs> insane to me the the serendipitous <laughs> events that have happened. It's just crazy. That was, that was crazy because we weren't even close when we were at the high school. Like it was like we say hi to each other, but like we weren't close friends. But then this film kind of reconnected to us so i visit <laughs> your home and then see if i did good job on graphics and that was pretty authentic i i felt proud of myself with the tokyo dome feels tokyo dome so and move on to the next one rio san did the daikanyama one of the big city in tokyo design i i, I was responsible for a lot of uh, cities Look, capturing the atmosphere, not only to the concept stage, but also the kind of the film, uh, final 3D sets. So for this uh, location, I started with those uh, loose sketch. Daikanyama is uh, known as a quite residential area with the kabuzi like shops and restaurants. So I tried to capture that. It's not that difficult to me because I, I used to live kind of close to by uh, the company I used to work is there and I made sure to yeah capture the mood by having the night like trees and and vehicles and narrower roads there and 
move on to more refined stage. Here, I, I also try to keep, uh, keep the mood from the concept sketch, but also I've been playing around with the uh, uh, line work inspired by Otomo and Azuma Kiyohito's uh, uh, yotsu Yotsubato background, which I, yeah, proud of doing that, like a kind of march to Japanese comics. And also after the stage, I sort of, yeah, move on to the 3D stage and I I made this base 3D kit in ZBrush and the uh, previous team's Justina made a, a kit, uh, like a modular kit out of my uh, concept model. And we start placing those to the each locations uh, like this. So these are example of what you are doing for Tokyo Tower and Daikanyama. Um, one thing I noticed is like kind of when 3D artists place the building, they kind of kind of scatter between the there's a gap between the buildings, let's put it that way. Because uh, maybe it's like uh, LA things or American things, but like uh, Japanese buildings are so close to each other, almost you can touch. And I made sure that I, I was like kind of nitpicking that kind of atmosphere and then doing a lot of uh, paint over and doing the screen, hours of screen sharing and <laughs> like kind of uh, looking at the 3D program together and moving buildings together. And also the uh, the the ground level, it can it's easy to do that in three D, uh, but having like flat land. But I I uh, ask them to please make it more uh, hilly, like uh, having more ramps, and so that it feels like a uh, um, Tokyo, because like a like a Shibuya is like a it's like a valley, a little valley in the in the in the writings and. I tried to capture that in the in the film, and I'm glad it it um it's been successfully uh, expressed in the film. And same things uh uh this uh, example of the uh, the process of uh, screen capture we are working on the Akihabara. Um, the left images uh, uh around that uh the the Hamburger franchise, um, Mosburger. Mosburger, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm about to forget. I think you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a. So, Ooh. okay. So we we place the buildings, and kind of the make island, of buildings and populate that throughout the locations, and yeah, the previous teams Victor worked really hard on this and. And also the right two images, uh, the near the sob line, and then like Ultraman's about to hit his head to the uh, the train truck. The train truck is like a uh, the the bridge of the uh, the train tra track called uh, sob line. Sob line is the one I always take when I go to Akihabara. I'm I'm so glad I I could include that in the films and also. Yeah, made sure to uh, plant the uh, uh, trees along the road because that's uh, to me it's a pretty iconic to the Akihabara, and uh, yeah, they have a good balance in that. And, and wait, wait, and wait, wait! Can I talk about Sato-chan? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Sato-chan, everybody is the little elephant in the right top corner of uh, the right side images. So it's a little elephant character and. It represents, it's a mascot for a big pharmaceutical company in Japan. And in our movie, um, Ultraman uh, grabs Hatochan and then basically smash, oh, no, 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 Naronga um, mm. grabs Hatochan and smashes it against Ultraman's head and it breaks, basically. Yeah, there we go. So that's Naronga. <laughs> Thank you, Rio. <laughs> and this will come <laughs> into play in our presentation later. But um, <laughs> so, uh, so Sato-chan gets destroyed, but apparently they were not like the company wasn't very happy with it. So our directors had to send an apology, like an official apology for destroying their character. So stuff like that happens. <laughs> yeah, we just we just heard it, heard about it a few weeks ago. 
<laughs> what are you doing to our character? <laughs> yeah, it's such a cute one. Yeah, Satoshi is yeah, very to... to the Tokyo city for sure. Okay. So th this is like a later stage of the production. I yeah, this uh, green bridge is a sublime bridge, and yeah. I I was nagging to include that and also this uh, red buildings is a uh, like a Sega building now it's called a uh, uh, Gigo building and I I just changed an I changed the name to Fuji it's a uh, homage to the uh, uh, first uh, SSP SP member and I yeah and so story team really uh, seems like the the kind of disarrangement and then. Uh, they include that by like Ultraman touching the bridge and like sparks uh, visit and then happened and sort of uh, this shot is so beautiful. I think it might oh, be yeah. one of the most beautiful shot in the film. And I, I'm glad I could include those things and yeah, ended up in the film. So, and it's yeah, really hopefully... interesting because uh, like mm. we look at little shots in the film and before that, like I didn't look at shots as a designer but now like, oh man, that shot, that's just like half a second shot. It's like so well done, you know, like it, like that kind of stuff matters okay. to you, you know, and you're, you, you yeah. need to like unlearn that. But, um, but yeah, that's, yeah. Those little preach really matter to me. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I work really hard on uh, the capturing the, uh, the mood vibe of the cities and hopefully, you know, yen is super cheap now. So if you travel to Japan, Tokyo, and oh, I yeah. hope you can feel that uh, the vibe. Everybody buy is, yen. Uh, <laughs> from the film. Yeah, come to Japan, Tokyo. So yeah, that was a contribution to the city's look. And uh, moving on to the, the topic of this presentation, the daily habit for of the visa artists. So we all have the different background, like some is from uh, Korea and uh, Tommy has fashion background and I'm still based in Japan. And so uh, we like to talk about those different background and experience affects our film. Thanks, Yosan. I'd like to talk a little bit about myself. I come from fashion design background. I graduated fashion design college in Tokyo. And after graduate, I became fashion designer in Tokyo worked several years in there and after that I moved to New York as a pattern maker. As a designer I was always interested in like a western design and culture uh in personally and also professionally I created the design based on those my interests but then when I moved to New York it was my first time exposed to different culture, different perspective, meeting with a lot of people who I have been able to meet in Japan. That kind of that kind of experience changed my perspective and interest. And I started to build my interest to the Japanese contemporary and traditional design, art and design. So I started to stop by gallery or museum in New York and started to collect those books to learn about uh, my own culture. And this is some of the example of the books I, I've been collecting. And my habit is like looking at like those fashion magazines <laughs> and, and see, learning the uh, textile. Textile is something that I'm always interested in especially for those uh, Japanese traditional kimono textile is something I really love personally. So every time I go back to Japan, I stop by my fashion college to see my teacher and then talk about those teacher of the kimono design, the kimono sewing. So those, but, this is the photo I took. This there. is from your school? Sorry. This is from my Sorry. school. Uh, my school has yes. a museum. In the in inside the school, like the Western Museum and the Eastern Museum and like prop museum that they have like uh, shoes or just a fabric museum too, which is and it's free for me. <laughs> so I, I still buy. You know what? Them. Actually, Rio, I'm so glad you asked because when Tommy said like, "Oh, this is my school," I was just like, oh, "I'm probably mistake 
I, I probably heard something wrong, yeah. but like, this is your school? <laughs> Seriously? Like, what? <laughs> Me too, good. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. amazing. The school is in Shinjuku. You can take sword line to go to Shinjuku. Can we, can we, I mean, you don't have to be a student, so I'll, I'm an eye to go to the school at this museum. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah? The museum is next oh. to school, and it's free. What, 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 they, is, what is the name of school? A Bunka Fashion College. Bunka Fukusogaku. Bunka Bunka Fukush Fukusogaku. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, awesome. we can Yeah. Anyway, so those my personal interest was really, really sparked when I had a conversation with our director and character, art director and production designer to knowing the story behind Dr. Onda, our villain in the film, that about the story behind him was that he lost his family during the kaiju fight. And he kept those fabric from his family and stuck onto his kimono. So the costume has a story, like kimo his kimono has a story. And then when I heard about it, my, my heart was just like, wow, this is, which amazing and I really grateful for directors and art directors and production designer giving me this opportunity to explore the textile of the Dr. Sanders kimono. So this is the final version that what we see is final version of the after exploration that I received as a reference from character art director which was also a really great opportunity for me to collaborate with character designer like like we had like a almost everyday meeting to talk about what kind of fabric should be and she already had this idea about going with borrow it's called borrow technique meaning collecting like the a lot of piece in the fabric and then sew together to make a new fabric which was based on the Japanese culture during the war so that we didn't have a lot of money to buy new clothes. So we, it, with the creativity of the people back then, they, they create the fabric, like using the old fabric. So it was, every time I heard the, the assignment, the story about this assignment, I was like, so excited. <laughs> so I did a lot of uh, exploration about Dr. on this textile design based on Ultraman, Ultraman history. And his family has a different personality and a different story compared to Dr. Onda. So I started to explore that textile design for those family too. And this is the final version of his daughter, Akiko's textile design, which is very joyful and playful with the inspiration from Ultraman and Kaiju design. And this is the look of the Dr. on the family. Working on this assignment makes me liking him more and more. <laughs> Dr. on is my favorite character of the film. And moving on to location design, this is remote location for the film that like last part of the film, you, you see this location. This assignment was very special for me because this location was based on uh, John Aoshima, our co-director's uh, grandparents' house. So I, when I launched on this assignment, I received a reference, actual place of the parent, doctor, uh, grandparents' house. And I try to like bring that vibe as much as I can uh, to bring his nostalgia and memory to the film film so for all of the assignment i could have worked on this film i always try to like listen carefully what director is looking for and try to bring and reflect that um thought because directors have a lot of thoughts on this film and i wanted to how take that honor to visualize every aspect. And this one is very special, especially you have the feeling and story behind the location design. 
So, yeah. And later on the stage, I started to set dressing this location with a lot of memory of the Ken's family. And one of the very unique and memorable assignment for me is to set dress that map on this location to tell the story behind the Ken's father who has been looking for his wife and also his son's mother. So I, I grabbed my post-it and then started to write it down, like how, how one person try to find his love, you know, and try to literally try to become father who looking for his family, thinking about his family, struggle by his family. So this was really great opportunity to think about design in, from different perspective. Like it was really different compared to my past experience designing the location. So it was a really eye-opening assignment for me and a very special assignment for me um yeah as a yeah. business artist like i my goal is to capture capture what director is looking for what director is talk, thinking about and building the thoughts and reflect it to the design as much as i can so i'm still learning process but this experience working on ultra rising kind of give me an opening up that my way of thinking what visual development artist is by having the responsibility on variety of stuff. So it was really great opportunity. And moving on to Ryosun's amazing toy collection. Um, can, can you explain okay. a little bit about daily habit? Yeah. Uh, yeah, when it comes to the habits, uh... I to uh, collect a lot of toys, and this is the photos from my my house in Ehime. Uh, it's kind of embarrassing to show, but I, I just have those so many, and I didn't throw it away, and just carefully place them in the category. But it's been too much; it's been overwhelming nowadays. But uh, it really helps me to go through some of the work, thankfully, and my parents probably happy with that and so those years of toy collections leads me to I think to to pull off this assignment uh, which which is also like a, my dream uh, things as a designer which I never really expected to be honest to I can design the mech for the film although I do it in my spare time quite a bit and and yeah the i i really have to say thank you to directors shannon and john to yeah gave me this opportunity to do so and hopefully this toy is gonna be in this crazy shelf one day i don't know it depends on the how how much we sell this gigantron and ultraman toys and how much how many people watch the on netflix so people go watch Netflix and do the double thumbs up again. And when it comes to work, again, sorry, the, the toy collections helps me to sort of come up and like uh, being able to draw from like various angles. And it's really handy. And I highly recommend if you struggle to draw things from a certain angle and perspectives and uh, you can change the lens by, you know, moving uh, closer and far away from the toys. And uh, I think it's a good training to do, uh, do that for any artist. And also, it's uh, being surround yourself with the uh, fun ideas that you can reach. Then you can, it, it's not too difficult to come up with like, those like a beam weapons or uh, from missiles coming out. It's like a lot of homage from Gundams or Japanese um, mecha, mecha TV shows. And yeah, this this is uh, really fun. I just had fun. I, I forgot it was a job most of the time, actually. So yeah, it was fun. Thank you. And But 
other than, not only to the Thai collections, but I also travel and walk around and take photos around the house. Um, this is how it looks like around my house. Pretty much like a Totoro like kind of place. I wasn't too inspired by Totoro when I was young because the surrounding like environment is too similar and what it, why people so hyped about it. <laughs> but so, but yeah, I do appreciate nowadays. But... <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I take photos, but also I memorize quite a lot. I try to draw from memory, draw from memory. Like LA people like play, I mean, draw in the location as like a playing air, which I don't really do much because I, I get a lot of mosquito bite. You know, my, you can see my house is like a lot of rice field and surrounding and yeah. Outside is not the place to draw for me, but uh, yeah, I, I do admire those like a playing air people too, but. And as a result, uh, I I draw something like this as a uh, with my memory and the reconstruct in the head and so middle images like are uh, inspired by broccoli. So if you don't have something Totoro environment near your house, you can see inspired by the uh, plants in your fridge and please do so. And real uh, really does not like Totoro. Okay. <laughs> I do, I do. There's a toy somewhere. <laughs> right, let me show you. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry, Miyazaki-san. Yeah, I love you. Totoro. <laughs> I went to I went to Donguri Kyokoku yesterday. But anyways, I basically, do. if you I, want I, to I, be... I work in Ghibli, you know. Yeah. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Ahead. Ryu actually worked at Ghibli. Isn't that crazy, everybody? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, insane. it's uh, fun. Anyways, love Totoro. Didn't like it when I was young, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and also travel to travel a lot as well. Uh, this is a sort of images I, I was drawing when I was traveling Spain. And yeah, I, I don't really kind of uh, draw one by one, like a photorealistic. I, I just re memorize and reconstruct and draw from memory, which I kind of really enjoy. And yeah, so uh, daily habits, like collecting, like, like things you, that interest you and also uh, deep, uh, observe the things you truly interested and draw from that interest kind of things. Rio, did any of these inspire your work on Evangelion? Because Rio also worked on Evangelion. <laughs> like, what? Oh, yeah. I, I, I worked on the uh, concept. Uh, painting for the, the Paris scenes. You know, the, the latest Shin Evangelion, there's a Paris in it in the first beginning of the film. I, I lived in Paris for three months and that experience helped me a little bit. I, I was doing a lot of uh, mechanical uh, concept modeling, but I, I get to do, I got to do some of the paintings too. Uh, yeah, definitely helps travel a lot. And yeah. Take I photos and Remember hmm. during, during the time we worked together, you also kind of showed up on the, the period you live in the different country to like do the explore the world. Like, what was it? <laughs> I was I was in Mal Malaysia, yeah, oh, Kuala Lumpur. Okay. Kuala Lumpur. That was inspiring. And yeah. I see when, when I had a chance to meet uh, meet Leo in person, I see the sketchbook. <laughs> it was amazing. Mm. That he draw every every morning, right? Before yeah, every morning. Yeah, you didn't stop, talk about that, real. You draw every morning, basically. Every day. We can't see it. We can't put it oh. uh, against your chest. Like a mug mug shot in front of your chest. Come closer. Oh. <laughs> Come closer. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody who wants to see his sketchbook, you gotta come to Life Box. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, oh, that's not smart. Yeah. That's a smart one. But yeah. anyways. Yeah, I, I draw every day before the work and that some, you know, that's how I keep my motivation as well. Before the work, uh, before I go to bed, I, I just do the doodling and which kind of a meditation or like a daily habit for sure. Uh, all right, uh, moving on to graphics things. Um, yeah, I, we'd like to briefly talk about because like, uh, well, it, it was 
uh, graphics is like a, such an important uh, things for the film when it comes to um, creating Tokyo because Tokyo is filled with ads and information and and Tommy and I worked really hard on put that off like made all the ads which is like crazy and yeah can you show us like what you did Tommy yeah we had a responsible for doing graphics of the film and this graphics for Tokyo City is yeah one of the biggest one that we worked together a while um uh, making advertisement we search like actual business and advertisement in Japan and twist to our original to the film and making kind of parody <laughs> of the film like I remember we had a conversation hour and hour talking about how coming up with the gags with the business in Tokyo for example this is the traffic sign graphics based on actual traffic sign in Japan but in this film world it is normal to live with kaiju and ultraman so thinking that way they might have a traffic sign telling okay this is the area that ultraman shows up oftentimes like uh, and then breaks the building or something or the kaiju area for those twists like it was it was a lot but i also had a fun come up with those graphics the citizens of our film basically risk their lives going to work okay they risk their lives <laughs> they might get killed <laughs> okay <laughs> that's the reality in this universe mm -hmm. yeah. it's just a part of it right real sound like uh, what we were yeah. showing Part of it it's more. part of it part of it. definitely not all yeah <laughs> yeah and we place our graphics we designed to the model of the Tokyo city to for this part like the, for this stage we are carefully placing it to make sense to the actual Tokyo city for example the convenience store is such an iconic color in the Tokyo city which has to be placed at the first floor. The convenience store never placed in the second floor of the building. So convenience store is first floor or like a karaoke karaoke place is a more higher up floor. Those kind of stuff we pay a lot of attention to graphics and placement. And Ryo-san yeah, uh, did Akihabara, which if you went Never went visit Akihabara, you know, crowd <laughs> Akihabara city is. So this yeah, is... it's uh, filled with the information for sure. I think like high, one of the highest density yeah. uh, kind of place. So I make sure to include that in the films if we have to make Akihabara. And I was so hyped to do that. And yeah, it's a lot of uh, homage to existing company's logo and homage to some of the kaiju names or Ultraman members. And also uh, one thing that we, as we work and we notice is like, if we try to come up with two original, it feels kind of off because a lot of ads and company's logo is kind of tied down to Japanese uh, sceneries already. And we try to keep the color, uh, as it is, like uh, Uniqlo's uh, things or a lot of convenience stores, the colors. And by doing that, and then I, I made this uh, company's uh, logo uh, based on the existing uh, real franchise called Go Go Curry, which is like a uh, bottom left in this uh, images. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it becomes an official collab, which I didn't no, it's hap It's coming. I, I just like seeing the Instagram or um, Twitter, and it just pops up. And oh my gosh, what's going on? Kind of like you just went walked outside and you saw your own logo, being like, "What is going on? Why? What?" <laughs> I was scared to be honest. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's, it's so like crazy. a school, like a teacher found out you're like doing something wrong, and who did this kind of thing. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Uh, and that's a real yeah, curry. Uh, you can actually buy it. Real curry, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it's you, crazy. You... I bought 10 of them. So yeah, support the uh, Gogo Curry and Ultraman Rising. So double, double thumbs up. <laughs> for double both. thumbs up, please. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Ooh. there's a homage to, uh, 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 what, sorry, can, can you explain the, uh, the, the, the insurance companies is a, based on what is it oh the insurance company oh insurance company. Uh, yeah it's it's based on our our, our team, team member oh you you mean this ad? yeah yeah, yeah there's yeah. adam's name and then yes oh oh like in, their... this in this shot in this shot yeah it has like my name in there and then yeah, there's like marcos's name in there like a lot of our <laughs> artist names are in this image actually which which it's were great. our intention to hide those that you you find it later on yeah mm. i just tell something okay this one actually says your name and <laughs> i had no idea i i learned that like two days ago basically yeah. when you told me <laughs> yeah, we <were> like, <laughs> you know, you're gonna be surprised what this is <laughs> i had a lot of our oh, uh, love to the team in the in the graphic design i'm gonna watch it again and i'm gonna find my name it's gonna say sunman i hate you <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay you're gonna find it <laughs> yeah but yeah yeah that was fun right yeah mm -hmm. and also we like the took the graphic design for tokyo city was a big one we also did variety of graphic design for the film Oh, uh, this one was a logo design for the KDF, Kaiju Defense Force, on the film. It was the first time for me to design logos. So I I look up all of the... Ultraman has so many generations in history, and each generation has a own logo represent that generation. So I look through all of the history and the logo, the logo, like history, how can I say, logo arise and how logo become developed to the current or latest one and try to keep the spirit to the dispersion of the logo. It was a fun experiment and uh, I took this original generation use like very recognizable font. So I took the design from font and it twisted to the new design. Um, Texture likes version C, so we went with version C. So you can see this logo is on uh, the costumes of the KDF. So it was it was fun experience to do variety of work in this film. One thing I wanted to add to this was that I think we did a fun event one time where everybody in the art department and then like the story department, anybody in like on the project was allowed to turn in like a KDF design. We did like something like that once, yeah. And then um, I think it was like one of the ones, the ones that won that the directors picked was like in consideration as well. And so that was like kind of a fun thing that we did just like team-wide. I just re reminded of that, sorry. Cool, yeah. Cool. And you also, you did a, a lot of different a variety of graphic design too. Um, can you? Yeah, I I did a lot of uh head head up display designs, um, which is like uh inspired by Casio's G Shock, which is like a Japanese watch, and it has a very edgy, strong shapes, uh, in it, and I I used a like sort of hexagonal shape from that watch and kind of applied that all over the film. And also, it's uh, inspired by Evangelion's very expressive graphic design as well. Um, also, after I did all those uh, art designs, I, as a reward, you know, like art design and also the sign signages on the streets, and and I got to draw uh, kaiju kind of anatomy an anatomical like diagram kind of drawings and I did 10 of them and my favorite is this uh, King Joe's uh, internal structure and external uh, kind of hierographic kind of look drawings 
which uh, which seems like the people use it for the rap party. I yeah, ex I, I was about it. to say. Speaking <laughs> of hieroglyphics, we actually use these designs to create these. Um, I think they're like filters for those kind of uh, projectors. And so we had these images of the kaiju hieroglyphics at the Egyptian theater with the other hieroglyphics. <laughs> <laughs> Egyptian is a, is, is a theater here that I think Netflix owns, so. It was so cool. This dish is also cool, like uh, someone's <laughs> drawing. <laughs> uh, anyways. Uh, Guys, I only have this, this popcorn <laughs> thing. All right. That's pretty much it from our presentation. Yeah. And, ooh, this quick image that I, when I, when I was young. Yeah, it's like a three years old myself doing the spacesuit beam pose and wearing the taro mask with my brother. So it kind of if what it means to me and also a lot of Japanese people. Like, yes. so I'm really grateful to be able to work for the film. Yeah. Thank you. I also watch. I grew up watching Ultraman, so it means a lot, a lot to work on this film. So it's it's been a real mm. honor, grateful experience for me too. This was an honor for me as well. I mean, to be honest with you, it was like so much pressure because, you know, it was a Japanese property and also, you know, Ultraman. I didn't grow up with Ultraman. So I felt really conscious, self-conscious of the, about the fact that am I going to be the right person for this? And so, you know, I did have a phone call with Shannon early on when I was offered the role. Like, am I, do you think I'm the right person for this? But yeah, I mean, it's been an honor. I'm so glad that the reaction's been very good. I'm so glad that like people who love Ultraman love the film. And like, that means a lot to me that old fans, like, you know, I'm sure that there are people who don't like it, but there are a lot of fans have like um, accepted Ultraman Rising as part of like the family. And so very, very grateful, very grateful. So I'm going to go through some questions audience questions first and if we run out of them then i'll ask mine <laughs> and you guys can ask me some so first question from amber how does branding like this work in a feature film did you have to get approval from legal for all the designs or did they give you a list list of pre-approved companies and i think that this pertains to graphics So, so what I, what I know, my understanding of, of what happened behind the scenes was that in Japan, anime and stuff like that, the legal issues are a lot looser. So, you know, they can put in Coca-Cola, they can put in Pepsi and it would not be an issue. But for us, I think that there were certain things that we had to kind of jump through. And so, for example, like one of the things I remember was when we were doing Coca-Cola for something, we couldn't use the actual logo. We had to do like a draw over of the logo from a Getty image or something like that. <laughs> it was really like confusing and complex, but that's just how it worked. And so we did run it through legal and they did take a look and none of these were an issue. So, you know, Rio and Tomi did not have to deal with that side, luckily, <laughs> but yeah, so... Anyway, so second question from Claire, how do you practice your design and visual development skills? Are there any exercises you do? Well, clearly you do send the exercise every morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I personally yeah. do like plein air painting uh, and whenever I have the time and also like drawing practice as much as when I have a free time and try to draw. Uh, on iPad, which which I couldn't do that much when I was working on Ultraman Rising, because like because it was my first experience working on feature film, I was like literally panicking every time. <laughs> I got to make sure that I I understand as I mean I understand. So but now um, I think. I talk with yours a lot of time how important to do the personal work on your free time. So I'm trying to go out and paint as much as I can. I think you're yeah, Tommy. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Oh, it's okay. Go ahead. Oh, Sorry. no, no. Tommy seems like a juggle, like teaching and professional work and some other stuff for the, the books. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't do that many. So I don't as work as hard as you. <laughs> That's, I, I rest a lot. I go to cafes a lot, chill out a lot. And, but I draw, I do draw a lot. Yeah, I think that was like don't... a big yeah. learning that I, I learned from yourself. That like he enjoy drawing time. Like he is creative to make the time, the drawing time enjoyable for himself. I was like, it oh, is. I, yeah. Like, oh, you can go grab iPad and go to the cafe and have fun drawing. And like, oh, that's true. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, because I, I picked this job because it's fun, exciting. And I just try to keep as this as long as I can. Mm. And I think it's, I don't know, a lot of those like uh, enjoyment seems fading away as you work and a lot of talk to a lot of artists and they don't do personal work as much which is okay we like doing other responsibilities and stuff like you know raising kaiju baby or yeah yeah so <laughs> um but uh, i try to just keep this as long as i can and it's still fun for me but i like if i don't travel and if i don't have those toys like it, it'll be a lot harder actually so mm -hmm. I, I know it's like a kind of like like a joke, but like I kind of collecting them like professionally, seriously. Oh, I I I need this because next time I this I get this assignment, I have to be able to draw. This time, like a transformation thing, um, it was cool because the ILM worked really hard on that, and but on my side, I I felt like I wanted to do a little bit like a better job. If you know next time if there's any transformation things happens on my lap and I'll I'm gonna do my best I'm ready <laughs> I'm ready now so. <laughs> but other things not transformation things you're not gonna do your best is that where you're well, saying you go? <laughs> everything anything he's gonna go to the cafe basically <laughs> I'm just kidding yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding okay so actually next uh, question is for you Rio Rio I was wondering if you were going to have an art of art book of the art you worked on this series okay here's the thing the ink drawing uh, referring to the ink drawings okay so we are not allowed to sell ultraman stuff but we can sell our personal stuff <laughs> so real are you going to make a book of your personal ink drawings i do i mean I, i'm i'm selling oh, i get like censored i, <laughs> I, I do have right. one already yeah he already has one right 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 you were selling those, it at but, uh, uh Lightbox. Yeah, I'm selling at Lightbox and uh, it's available on Booths, which is like a Japanese website. It might be harder for American people to get. But yeah, I'm, I'm making another one this year. So it's I'm just keep making. I, I think I'm going to do it for next few years. And some book deal coming up. I cannot really say it. Hopefully. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work on BD, Bandes, Bandesine, like a style. Let's see. Cool. Cool. We have something to look forward to, everybody. And um, so Betty asks, I think this is for Tomi, um, what resources would you recommend for artists who aren't familiar with Japanese culture and textiles, but want to do a character design project based on Japanese culture? What, what uh, resources? So, yeah. So any resources like references or resources that non-Japanese art artists can look at for their kind of Japanese culture projects. I personally really recommend to go museum because the, the museum has their own research resource, which is very specific to the content of the museum. Right now, if I try to find the resource in the Google, too many information shows right. up. And like, it's so hard to see which one is right for you. So I think the book or museum is already curated to the right, how can I say, information. It's like- Oh, that's I, smart. I, You're saying like a book, a, a book that's been curated by a museum that talks about like kimonos or textiles, yeah. like those are helpful. Oh, that's super yeah. smart. 
that's like 100 correct mm -hmm. information if it comes from museum yeah. and oh, that's so clever it's like i highly recommend and then especially for if you're interested in like traditional uh, art from japan uh, there's a because museum usually oftentimes they change the context of the museum by like a period of time but traditional japanese art or textile design there is like how can i explain this like hakubutsuka like uh the museum that museum. stays forever with the context mm -hmm. same context oh i see so they only deal with a certain era or a certain style and they kept going for years and years i see like, cool yeah yeah like I, oh no I, did you were you gonna say uh, I was like, I would try to come up with that if there's any cool museum in LA, but like, oh, I know a lot. Yeah. You know what? Actually, Tommy, what you could do is you could probably um, share some like kind of books that you know um, on your social media, and then maybe the people here can follow you and, and see those titles and stuff, maybe. I'll prep for that and then later on I'll share mm -hmm. it on social media. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so, next question is. Um, how do you, the cultural consultant team, um, strike the balance between depicting Tokyo you have personally experienced and a Tokyo that is recognizable enough for Western audiences? So how did you portray places that were very familiar to you, but also non-familiar in Tokyo or yeah. in Japan? Yeah. That part, I think our cultural committee meeting helps a lot, right, Yosa, to like, uh, yeah. because everybody has a different perspective in Tokyo even in Tokyo like someone think different like design as an icon of Tokyo but while someone think oh that could be this you know we had every week conversation yeah. meeting conversation about what could be how can I say authentic to everybody like while keeping yeah. some stuff while while I was working with the uh, previous team, Victor and uh, Justina, I we kind of talk a lot about sort of where needs to be sort of iconic in each locations, mm -hmm. and so for example, Dai Daikanyama is that Staya is iconic ones, and uh, Roppongi is like a, there's like a highway bridge uh, behind uh, where where uh, Emmy shows up, and we kind of made a kind of a place that as an icon and then we we don't want everything is like super bright and like an energetic kind of but rather the kind of uh, prioritize which building kind of uh, needs to be more paid attention and also balance it with like a trees and the kind of things uh, and again like Akihabara like a Sobu line bridge and um sega uh, game arcade is like very iconic place so make sure that that place has the most dense information and everything else is like a less dense so that that's the how we balance and like kind of make it iconic and recognizable like we we didn't just do everything with the like uh details so it's, it's and, a lot um, of detail but yeah sorry sorry I'm, I didn't mean oh, to talk over you, but um, no, no, no. just to add, to add to all this is that like some of the locations that we designed were decided by the directors because they wanted to pay homage to certain locations that they've been to. Like Tonkatsu Tonki is a real Tonkatsu shop that you can visit in Tokyo. They're the Tsutaya bookstore that Emmy kind of screams and the window breaks. That's a real place that you can go to. And there are these like little places that really do exist that we wanted to make sure to put in because of the director's request so that people can visit these locations. I mean, that was like a special part of, of why we picked some of these locations, but obviously we do have some areas that are like kind of like made up, you know, like it's not like perfectly the same, yeah. but it feels like it's in that neighborhood. Like it's in Daikanyama, it's in Akihabara and stuff like that. So that's kind of how we dealt with some of those. So the next question is, will there be a second Ultraman film? And how long did it take to make the film itself? 
I think that the second film is going to be a question for our executives. And so if you all want us to make a second film, the best thing that we can do is to rewatch the film or give it a double thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> we, we kindly ask you to go do that on your Netflix accounts and your family's Netflix accounts. That would be great. But so how long did it take to make this film? I think just this film, like Ultraman Rising itself, probably around like, wait, so we started COVID, like we started right when COVID started. So how many years has it been since then? It's like four, four, five, four years, five years, four years. And we finished end of last year. So we actually, actually, fun fact, we've been holding the movie since like the beginning of January to, to release. So yeah, we finished last year. So yeah, that's how long it took. And next question, yeah. I think I know the answer. Will you guys be at the Lightbox Expo this year? And you guys will be at Lightbox, right? You guys have a table? Yeah, Great. yeah. Uh, um, we're doing a different table this year, but yeah. But, okay, okay. You guys like, have yeah, like grown really. out into like independent. No. <laughs> 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 okay, cool. But you you will all see um, Tommy and Rio um, at Lightbox this year. Yes. Luckily. And uh, number eight, uh, the question is, any online courses you recommend for people who want to strengthen their biz dev skills? Um, do you do you both teach anything? No, that, not at the moment. I mean, oh, I yeah, see. do you? Not at the moment, neither. <laughs> I well, used to teach um, high school. Yeah. In high school. Well, okay. Wait, didn't you say that you had a hard time with that, Tommy? <laughs> you, like, okay, would, you, would you like to share this with them? not on recordings <laughs> well, I had a hard time but it's not the reason why I don't do, do that anymore I, I got a little busy for I work on children's book too so then like now I'm working on children's book so a little busy but I had a hard time <laughs> <laughs> well, only was a little you know, too uh, I mean I think it. I think it's like interesting because mm -hmm. oh no no go ahead real. Oh no no! I, I took a uh, Ken Lee's class, who's uh, our uh, you know member member yes, of the visitor yes, team. That's true. Yeah, Ken Lee's was my teacher too. Oh yeah, so. Ken Lee yeah, was my it's... TA in school. It's not oh, crazy. It's crazy. So Ken Lee, learn I from heard. Ken Lee. That's all I can say. I think he's the background design class at the or C CDA. CDA CDA CDA. I think yeah CDA. I took his class at CDA when I was a student at Art Center. He didn't know I could, like, a later year, I could work with him for Old German Rising. So it was amazing. amazing. Mm. Ed, um, Ed Lee thing... is great, too. I, I took his class. Ed Lee? Oh, Ed, Ed. Lee, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, one great. thing I just wanted to recommend really quickly off of this topic is you can practice. You can take classes. There's fantastic classes out there. You can go on Gumroad. You can take CDA, you can take CGMA, you can take schoolism. All these classes are available. Um, one of the things that can set you apart if you're looking to kind of add something to your arsenal is that I would try to read and also just kind of like look at things outside of animation a lot because I think that those are the things that really set you apart is how you think and how you come up with ideas instead of how well you express them, if that makes sense. So like how well you draw, that's, some, that's something that you can always work on. And like, we're still growing in terms of skill level, but what makes us special is the way we think and how we build storytelling in the environments that we design. We build storytelling into like the small, like, you know, Tomi was talking about like the post-it notes, like those types of things are like lived in experiences. And I can't emphasize enough how you all mm. like, you know, practice, draw whatever you need, but also like hang out with your family, hang out with your friends, find calmness, find what a, a hobby that you love. It will teach you things that you've never, ever, ever thought about before if you just have interest and curiosity. So I just wanted to add that to, to that yeah. for that person. Oh. Add into and that. So and uh, sorry. Oh, uh, like in the photos, like I, I include my nephews in it and like I, I saw his reaction towards everything, and it's very interesting. Like uh, it, it, like a real life Totoro, like 
things like may may is like reacting things and and memorize that kind of fun things like like and sort of bring that into your work like those like uh, online classes of course helped but also like your experience always kind of kind of like uh give you the voice in your art and so in in a way i cannot tell like what you have to do what you should do it's like only you know like what interests what what you are interested in. so uh surround yourself with like things you like in my case it's the toys and some plants and and yes living in many countries is that really interests me so i keep doing that and then also like a drawing things is just a kind of you know what that's my profession profession but also interests me like so combine it my interests and it becomes kind of work kind of yeah so, also yeah you never know what possibility you have until you experience something new and then open up like new new you <laughs> i don't know how to say it. like it's like it's all coming from experience i think so yeah it's like uh you're doing fashion and and mm -hmm. also interested in animation and kind of combine your skill set and being able to do the visit of really like, interesting uh, like, well, so you see like a uh, totoro for you rio san you see how appealing and how interesting how the the meaning is like later on sometimes when you mm -hmm. come back to the certain things that you didn't see before you suddenly can see it <laughs> to me the, yeah, lang yeah. the language is same too like uh, uh i couldn't speak english at all first time i went to new york and then i struggled a while like several years and i went back to japan and i come back to new york i suddenly can hear some some terms like i don't know what's happening but that, that happens sometimes <laughs> like your your interpretation or perspective change un yeah unconsciously. Mm. Yeah. yeah it's like um yeah. you you have you need a little bit of distance between certain things to really appreciate it or to start to pick up things um which is a really interesting concept the next question is Different. How would amateur artists going into VizDev go about getting used to drawing intricate details for backgrounds such as cities? Do you guys have any advice for that? Mm, yes. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> again, like, sorry. The, I I get the diorama, like a diorama toys for the, uh, like a trains. There's like a, like a gener generic buildings or like a Japanese buildings. If you go to like a, uh train it's like a light train layout shops they sell those toys there then you can draw like buildings from various angles if you buy some some of that and which i actually really do and that helps me a lot and also i draw like uh neighbors quite a lot too like they're like a air conditioning units or it's just like a you don't have to start from like build and drawing like epic things but there are a lot of uh, things interesting you just don't notice which is like a things i learned from miyazaki like are we that's like a things he, he had like a lesson for like a younger artist like just joined the ghibli and like you don't there's a lot of things like around your you know your daily daily life like there's a textbook everywhere you don't have to do anything crazy. Just observe and memorize and draw from that. And we, when we went to uh, like a company trip, it's like kind of small town, and everybody already like came back to like a bus, buses, and then waiting for the bus to to go embark or and off to the highway. But like. A, Miyazaki is like a last person. He's just always like like looking around and doing that like a location scout until like literally door close. He's the last person to be on the bus, and and I I I was really surprised how he's so interested in just uh, observing and those things. So yeah, that's I I took from him. <laughs> I think also just one yeah. thing I wanted to add to all this is like. 
I mean, there's like the, I think that a lot of the times when we look at complex things, we're, we're like very thrown off by the frequency of how loud it is. And so when you look at a city image, it's just like, oh, there's so much stuff, like it's just loud, you know? So in cases like that, you want to break it down into like the bigger blocks, basically. And so just like think about the bigger picture, like the actual structures, you know, like the the pillars, like the, the building pillars. Another trick that you can use, obviously, at beyond 3D is like, you know, you can just draw like the flat fronts of all the buildings and then just like put them all kind of side by side flat and then just kind of put them in perspective. And that, you know, that can be a trick that you want to use. Like there's so many ways to go about it. So I, I would say like, you know, the biggest comment that I can give is just don't focus on the details. Think about the bigger kind of blocks when you're building a city. Next question is, do you, do any of you ever feel imposter syndrome in the industry as people uh, or women of color? I know there are a lot of efforts to diversify the realm of animators, and I am curious about that environment as a person of color myself. So do you guys have any thoughts on that? Mm. You know, like uh, working from Japan. So, so it's like uh, there are a lot of uh, those like uh, sort of uh, race like topic things and like there's a conversation in the in the company. I, I just, you know, it's far away, from, like working from like a Totoro-ish house and I don't really feel too much. But mm -hmm. when it comes to like a, like a speaking in English, I, I still pra still practicing watching a lot of YouTube and yeah, talking to you guys helped me a lot. And definitely I feel not like a in, inferior like not not as strong as like the rest of the american people something like but uh the imposter things yeah i mean so i work hard try enjoyed it and i try not to think too much actually yeah is it it is what it is if they let me go and i'll just go and do my drawing things and uh, but i i just work I I try I just try to enjoy it and, and work hard and I ho I just hoping the film is turn out to be great kind of things so people uh definitely uh, animation as long as I know like people don't care about skin colors in my, in my opinion the team of Ultraman Rising is like really uh really great and a lot of uh people people with colors sorry that's the way to say it but. It's like encouraging. I mean, I didn't feel any anything inferior about myself about that job, so it's good. Tommy, Tommy, would you do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I think uh, I had a great experience on the Ultraman Rising. But then I think I wanna ask how 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 about you, Tommy, as a leader, you the leader in the animation industry. So I I think it will be great advice for me too. Like at this mm. point, I don't have any like. Well, so in terms of like skin color, a person of color and all that stuff, uh, imposter syndrome, I would say like, I don't feel imposter syndrome about being Asian in animation, because I do think that, you know, Asians in general, like we've been pretty like active, like, you know, in anime and all that stuff. So it's like animation and anime, like they kind of blend together. So, and also like, I think that the industry does have a good amount of um, Asian folks as well. So me being an Asian like woman, like it, it's never, there's a lot of Asian women, I think in the industry, like from what I see, one of the things that does kind of like trigger a thought in me on this topic is, is that I think that there's a lot of studios that are trying to get this whole diversity thing right, you know? And, you know, they do a lot of lectures of like, oh, what does diversity mean? And, and what, you know, what does that mean for us? Like, how do we behave differently? Or like, or are we supposed to inform people? Like, there's a lot of these conversations that are happening at a company, like wide level, you know, but one of the things that I want to emphasize is that first, it's like very important for the directors to know if they want to make a culturally accurate movie or they want to make something that's like not quite culturally accurate and it's like a little bit more imaginative having that goal and knowing that for the pr production itself is very very helpful 
for not just the company, but the whole team in general is very helpful. But also one of the things that I've been seeing that has been an issue is that a lot of the times when you're hired because you're from that culture, you end up becoming pigeonholed into just kind of being the cultural accuracy artist, let's say. So those are the things that are popping up that I'm seeing where like people are reaching out to me and saying, you know, one of our projects was based in Haiti, um, you know, and, you know, like there was an artist from that country and, you know, and, you know, she expressed like, I'm only doing things that are just related to this thing, my, like this culture. And I, I'm not being allowed to do imaginative work, let's say. And so these are the things that, you know, we're seeing kind of like as a pushback almost. And so I think that we still need to continue to have conversations of um, what production as a culturally um, accurate kind of production looks like. So for example, I, I would really like for productions to make that decision, okay, we're going to do it very culturally accurately. So when they hire artists, they're upfront about it. So when they hire like somebody like Tommy for Ultraman, right? We are upfront that, oh, Tommy, we also need cultural help. So you will be doing some of that work, but also we want to make room so that you can do creative work as well. And so if they're upfront about it, then we can expect that. And so I just, I just want to make sure that like we are di putting diversity out there, but we're not putting it all on the shoulders of one or two people, if that makes sense for production. So those are just like things just that, you know, I, I would love to start a conversation just like in your mind or just, you know, create some thoughts on it and create a dialogue. But yeah, I mean, that's my thoughts on that. The next question is, how do you, yeah, how do you go about walking the, uh, the line between cultural accuracy and fantasy. For me, and this is uh, Grace Ha uh, asking the question, for me, I often struggle deciding if I want to draw with historical accuracy versus my own vision. Do y'all have any answers to that? Sorry, the, can, can so, you paraphrase it, the question? Yeah, like, so basically like, how do hmm. you go about drawing something that's not like, basically a documentary it's like there's slightly yeah. a fantasy yeah, yeah, yeah. element to it what are the thoughts that go in your mind to make that balance possible i mean i think you okay. mentioned you guys mentioned that like the color of certain brands like when you change that color it just feels like so yeah, feels off, off. So gotta, and then yeah. you pr bring the color back in so you're just kind of like pushing and pulling pushing and pulling maybe yeah I feel um, like okay i'll oh, go ahead go ahead. sorry oh sorry sorry no, 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 no. I think we're gonna try to say this similar thing. I, I'm so sure. Oh. I think it really depends on the assignment itself. So. Um, but then we had a lot of going back and forth, doing like our design and then check from distance or from a lot, a lot of uh different perspective from the team to like analyze if it's like accurate enough yet original like there's something original to it um okay uh, so. well sorry uh yeah my take is uh like a okay my i've been working under uh goro miyazaki and i i've been looking at the all those references on the screen and crazy things he told me is don't look at them like close them like he called me like a young bitch young young bitch young close them all like don't look at it memorize it then draw from that and that's oh, something wow. i never told and which actually very very helpful one of the most helpful advice i've ever got because if you look at it it's open up the, on the screen and like if you look at it all the time it's very very similar to that if the you know certain trend popping up and everybody's looking at the, the kind of trend things on the screen, right? On Instagram or, uh, so that's my memorizing things like happen. And so you can reconstruct that in your head. And then there, a lot of non-important things gonna, you know, drop, but only important elements of certain things of the city is still there. And then emphasize that and reconstruct that. And later on, you can, of wow. course, I mean, I do a lot of research and 
and support that kind of the image you will build without the uh, reference. So that's it's, the approach I take. Bro, that's like gold. Holy wow. Yeah, that's like, like such good advice. It's a okay. MP2 out of five. <laughs> that's so awesome. Dude, so are you saying that I should not be looking at my GPS? Is that why I'm lost all the time? <laughs> like I need G to start memorizing where I'm uh, going. <laughs> like oh, I am, I because of the GPS, I can't. I still can't go to work. And I've been going to work for years. Like I still can't go to the Netflix campus without my GPS. <laughs> and oh. so look, uh, it's making us stupid. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm so really good at the is... maps, actually. So oh, you you're talking about the like a like a map things, right? Like on the yeah, on the yeah. Because like I don't I don't memorize places anymore. I don't memorize oh. phone numbers anymore. You know, and so it's that's like, the one thing losing. I'm very very good at, like memorizing. Oh, things. good for you. Good for you, Bio. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Well, I'm really brag too much yeah, about I, my. <laughs> your real son, no, no need to Start with that, your neighbors. Start with your everyday surroundings. <laughs> Go to a convenience store without looking at your phone. <laughs> so, but I think like, that um, we're. Yeah. Real has a lot more to say, but I think. <laughs> I think we're ready to wrap, actually. We're past Sorry. time. I mean, there's still like a lot of great questions. You know, I, I just want to answer some really quickly so that y'all can have your answers. When you're ready to be, when are you ready to be a VizDev artist, like to start working? That's when you get hired and you learn on the job. That's my short answer. What is it like working remotely from Japan in the American animation industry? What are the struggles? How did you overcome that? Tommy, you talked sure. about language stuff. Real, you, you have your, you have like your visa stuff. Visa is like a big thing. Oh yeah, um, give me a visa really big thing. so I can come to America. <laughs> See, I, you should have told me that like that conversation wasn't moving forward. Cause like, if you told me that I would have moved it forward. Next time you come to like, uh, like me, big sister, and then we get it done. Okay. So she really those are the yes. rough, uh, just kind of like loose kind of things that we struggle with. Um, how do you guys continue to have fun while drawing? In other words, staying motivated despite there being a risk of burnout while working in the animation industry question mark and mm -hmm. i think rio you said i mean you draw every day that's like i mean how you well yeah also like sleep exercise eat well like mm -hmm. i do i mean sleep like eight nine ten if you can like sleep longer than normally normal people probably and people sleep less nowadays that's i uh, the advice and mm -hmm. The, but every waking hours, just enjoy it and draw it. And yeah, it's like surround yourself with something cool. interesting. Tell me. Yeah. Yep. I burn out all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to. It's just like problem. one and the opposite, basically. <laughs> yep. yep. Right. But, but then I started to, you know, learn good balance. Like, I, I won't be the good advisor for you because I do experience burning out only because of my passion and to do to deliver good good you know art <laughs> that was like i think i push too hard sometimes but thanks to uh something and we also i had a lot of conversation about this too <laughs> to how to take care of like myself to do the good good work <laughs> yeah i mean I we think... we have a lot of esoteric conversations and like we we try to be encouraging with each other if we find new things to think about we send it to each other and it's been really great and one of the things i want to say is like burnout basically i would say is when you're putting in a lot of effort into something and you're not getting the rewards at all that's when you burn out when it's not even money wise it's like you're doing a lot of work but you're not seeing the appreciation of your boss or your directors you're doing a lot of work, but it's being disregarded. So that kind of stuff really burns you out when you're just like, what is the point anymore? And the beautiful thing about working on your own stuff is that you never burn out because when you're working on your own stuff, you're just so excited, you know? And so that kind of stuff replenishes you to do your own work. When you're burnt out, you just need to take a break and refresh your mind a little bit because a lot of the times people think that artists are just like their wrist 
it's really not it's it's all coming from your mental space you know you 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 become a better artist when you are a better human being or you you're well read or you know you're informed or you have something to offer you know and so these are all coming from your mental kind of hemisphere and so I would say take a break, look at look after yourself, understand what's precious to you, because a lot of the times the things that are precious to you show up in your work because it means a lot to you and you subconsciously put that in your work. And so those are the types of advices that I can I can give you. Lastly, when you draw, do you draw with the intent of creating a polished product or just getting an idea on the page? Oh, I don't mm. I don't I do the polished product at all <laughs> I, I just try to have fun there you mm. go i feel fun I, I personally love doing traditional painting using gosh it's just like the the f- moment the feeling of the moment i'm being outside feeling the wind when hearing the sound that nature is making and the paint i just love the moment and artwork Making artwork isn't the reason I go there. I just go there to experience the moment. So I I don't care about how Polish the, my painting is. If if I could make Polish painting, it's just yay, <laughs> lucky lucky day. Yeah. Kind of. yeah, I think that's a yeah good way to approach it. Uh, the same as well. Like I don't, I really try to enjoy the process as as much as I can. I I don't show my drawings except for my wife <laughs> and sometimes i show it to you guys too but it, it's like showing it to other people makes me pressure like you know people is going to make fun of that or if, but like you know if your personal drawings turns out great then you can post it of course and so maybe like having that kind of like protective things like you're not being judged by these drawings and also things you have to show it to the you know other people as a portfolio so so keep doing the things that that uh, you know people are not going to the things that people are not going to judge as, as a daily basis as a kind of a like a muscle stretching kind of uh, exercise and uh, if there's uh, anything interesting or things you feel confidence to show it to other people then like polish you to the uh, the level you can put it in your pro- portfolio kind of things and i completely agree with everything rio said and to top to just kind of like add it, add more to what he just said is that when you're in vis- visual development you kind of quickly learn that you're one of one or two artists usually um there's like the artist that has like a very distinct style and everything that they create is in that style some people some other people have a more generic style or or they adjust to other styles and when you prefer creating ideas getting ideas across i would say like that I think it it depends, but for me, like I pride myself that I'm an idea person instead of uh, a final product person, because ultimately I think that skill, skill wise, you can always like kind of bring yourself up to a certain level and you can polish it and like really perfect something, but you can either polish like something that's kind of an okay idea or a great idea, you know, and even a great idea, it doesn't have to look so great for it to be a wow piece, you know? And so, you know, even, I mean, during Ultraman, I've kind of realized how much, like, we put a lot of effort into making the movie look good, but what ultimately is important is if the story is good, if the story is relatable to other people and, you know, there's a journey there. And I mean, look at Shrek. I mean, you know, I I love Shrek. I love Shrek and Shrek is not the most attractive film. Okay. Like the first Shrek film, the first two Shrek films. And they're so me too, good. Me too. They're a legend. They're a, they're, a, they're a industry. Okay. By itself. And so, you know, I would say that um, if you're going about it in a viz dev way, I always welcome people to think more like a filmmaker, not an illustrator. So don't think about creating these beautiful wow pieces. Think about, okay, like what does this film re- need right now? What kind of drawings like, you know, is it 
even from like small like texture packets to like larger kind of mechanical kind of drawings it's like really thinking about what does this film need and so if you go about it that way and you have a conversation with your art director and production designer that way then you will quickly learn how to become a filmmaker because that's the type of knowledge you're asking for when you're working and so i would just say think like a filmmaker in any step that you're in so that's all I, I have to say about that. I think that that's the last question. We covered everything. Everybody's question got answered. Woo! But yes, thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you so much for hosting us, Asians in Animation, and everybody who supported us to, for this presentation. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Arigatou gozaimasu. Arigatou gozaimasu. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.